I'm Jesse Phelps, and this is Jessica Ellis. Uh, let's see, November of last year, um, I had been chatting with some people at another conference on uh, tech, tech stuff and in indicated to them that I was um, interested in using technology with agriculture and trying to do some small scale um, applications of that uh, and, and ideally eventually get to helping um, urban farming applications uh, do some things. And uh, they introduced us because Jessica was, um, she, Jessica's in charge of a healthy lifestyles program at the Boys and Girls Club in San Diego. And they have a big garden there and they were looking to apply technology to it as well and start introducing kids technology uh, in that vehicle. And um, so we got together and uh, have done a few things. And this is just kind of talking about uh, what we've uh, attempted, what we've learned, and uh, what we're trying to, to continue to do and where we're going with it. So fewer than 10% of schools offer any kind of computer science curriculum today. And uh, less than 1% of students actually attend any of that. And um, a, part of an organization that we're involved with as well, uh, Teaching Kids Programming, um, is how uh, all of the tech stuff started getting involved with the, the Boys and Girls Club, really. And we're uh, trying to produce curriculum to help change this. And the farming application of that is, um, it, it's really about applying a different context to the programming rather than just programming for programming's sake. It's let's use it for something else that kids might be more interested in um, in their everyday life already. The, uh, this is the user group that's at the Boys and Girls Club in San Diego now. And um, all of these teens are attending fairly regularly. And they attended 30 hours of Java programming um, just over the summer. Yeah, they did their second summer. Second summer. And they all uh, came back the following um, session as well. So the, uh, the retention rate has been 100% for us with what we've been doing. Um, and in the actual activities we're doing with them, it's all pair programming and uh, mob programming. So they're all actively engaged with each other um, just as much as they are with the technology. And that seems to be a very critical element of keeping the engagement up as well. Um, the, uh, as you saw there, they're all in the kitchen as well. And the Healthy Lifestyles program does, um, uh, does the farming. They teach how to cook. and. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's not, it's not about the technology itself. It's about life, and technology can help make that better, and that's really the vehicle through which we're going at it. So I have three sons, and Jesse has three sons. Um, my three sons are teenagers, though, and one of the things that I had noticed was that a lot of the coding events that were coming to town were girls-only coding events, and I actually called some of the girls' coding events and said, I have boys who are nice to girls, can they come? And I was pretty much told no. And, uh, and I really don't see how that's going to solve a problem that we all seem to recognize as a problem, which is normalizing the idea of men and women and boys and girls coding together. So we sought to normalize that. And um, our first step was in summer 2014, we ran a camp called Barbacode, which was half computer programming and half Greek barbecue cuisine. And when we put the registration out for that, um, we had 38% of the registrants were boys, 62% were girls. But of those 62%, I heard from every single parent to make sure this was for girls. It, it must be okay because you're cooking. You must want girls there because there's you know this other thing. And all of these parents really wanted their kids to be, their girls to be exposed to programming, but they didn't want them to be the only girl there. And so. Um, so the girls showed up, and this last summer, it was 70% girls, and I got no phone calls. So the girls went to their schools and said what they'd been doing, and they were all pretty much rock stars at, hours, at the Hour of Code in December. But we, our whole point is to make it just seem normal to them. We do not emphasize to the kids, you know, look what you're doing, or go see if you can code with a girl, or anything like that. Um, and so we have no rules about it, as you will see. Sometimes the girls get sick of the boys, and they kick them out of the room, and they take over. Um, and the other thing that you will notice is in this picture to the right, I don't know why he's making that face. That's my, my, older, uh, my middle son is, is it's at the top of the picture. And then Samantha 
is the girl standing, and those were our two computer programming camp counselors for camp. They were 15 the first summer they did it, and 16 the second summer they did it, and the kids learning from, from teenagers a few years older than them made all of the difference. Um, they saw it as so much more accessible, and I really think it's because of those two modeling treating each other respectfully while still teasing each other, while, you know, while still acting like teenagers. They got to see a boy and a girl have great respect for each other and their abilities, their technical abilities, um, while still just having fun. So um, these are two of our girls, Tristan and Katie, and that was summer 2014 and summer 2015, and they are uh, training right now this school year to be our camp counselors for summer 2016. And neither one of them had any computer programming experience when they started. Both of them just lit up at it. And this last summer was when they asked us, you know, next summer can I get a job? So I don't know what either of them will do in the future, but their very first summer jobs when they're, when they're 16 years old are going to be computer programming camp counselors. And I hope that that inspires them to continue doing what they're doing. So in the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to uh, bring technology to a context that the kids are already engaged in. And here, this is the garden uh, at the Boys and Girls Club, and they are already actively involved in planting and raising crops and, uh, and learning about what that is all, all about. And um, they're also very interested in world problems and things that are going on. And the question that was asked is, aren't we out of water? because this is in California. And so the kids were concerned about what's going on in their world, and they um, are looking for vehicles to which they can make a difference anyway. I mean, um, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about kids all the time are not the problem. Kids are naturally scientists. We teach them to stop being scientists. And uh, so the kids have questions, and they, they want to do things to make a difference. They just are often uh, not sure what to do. And all you have to do is just empower them a little bit, and they'll take it over and run it uh, after that. And that's what you see with all of the things we talked about with these, uh, the camps. We gave them the tools, and now the kids run it, and they propagate the knowledge among themselves on their own without us having to intervene too much. Um, so when they ask the question of, are, aren't we out of water? Um, and this is actually right around the time that Jessica and I uh, got introduced to each other, um, and this was the first thing that we wanted to try to do with the kids. So we decided to do a project where we would actually monitor the soil moisture content and uh, control the watering system, not based on just a timer, but based on the needs of the plants. So when the soil moisture content was low enough, we would trigger the watering system for a, a period of time and then um, you know, cut it off after that, and the only time we'd water again is when the soil actually needed it. Um, and I'm not like a, you know, an agro-science guy. I don't work at Monsanto or anything like that. I'm just, uh, you know, I do software development as a day job and, um, you know, play with other things on the side. Um, and uh, so we may not be doing, if any of you do work at Monsanto, you may laugh at what some of the things we're doing here because this may not be perfect, but it, it you know, helps the kids get the idea and, um, and, you know, think about how to solve the problem. Um, so um, this is a picture of an Intel Edison. And we chose to go with the Intel Edison for this initial project uh, because it had Wi-Fi built onto it. So it was easy for us to get access to a network connection and, and deal with all of that. Um, and this particular Edison um, breakout board will emulate the Arduino. And Arduino being fairly well established in the community and having lots of support around it and lots of modules and add-ons that you can get for it, we wanted to go this route um, because there would be an easy opportunity to build on it. But what we found, and this is, this is the code that uh, we had for them to have to write, and all we're doing here really is uh, there's a library for the moisture sensor. Um, the moisture sensor is right here, and this is just uh, has a capacitor in it. Or rather, it has a sensor in it reading the capacitance of the soil. And as the moisture content fluctuates, the capacitance um, between the inner probe and that outer casing fluctuates because the conductivity of the air between them will fluctuate. And uh, so that's really all, how this, this works, is just measuring that. 
Uh, and this is a fairly expensive way to um, monitor soil moisture. It's a lot easier to just use a resistive measurement, um, but that's a little less predictable and you have to calibrate it and all those types of things. So this was just nice and easy. You just stick the probe in the soil and you get a good reliable measurement. Um, and there was already a library available because of the existing Arduino community uh, to facilitate using this sensor very quickly. Uh, but getting this set up, uh, the code wasn't the hard part for the kids. It was actually all the other environmental aspects of getting it working. Getting the software installed and getting it set up and figuring out how to talk to the Arduino and, and all of those other things were really bigger impediments than what we had kind of anticipated they would be. We thought too much about making the code simple and not enough, uh, and I guess I should also add, one of, the, one of our goals was we want them to be able to go home and do this again. So if they, uh, if they were interested in it and wanted to build it again and add on to it, that was one of the things we wanted. So the, the idea was to show them from the ground up, starting from nothing, how would you get this up and going? And all of that setup work was far too involved. The code was actually not, not a difficult thing at all. Um, so we kind of consider this to be a failed project, um, it, but we learned from it. Uh, and this is just a quick sample of the output that they were generating here. And the goal in this initial phase, we were gonna iterate on this and move to um, you know, controlling the watering system. And, but we started with just getting the text output here of um, what is the actual temperature and humidity of the soil. And this just shows you a sample run where the soil needed to be watered and then it starts getting watered and now your humidity level goes up. Um, so the, one of the things we tried to do with this um, as uh, ex expanding on it with the kids was we wanted to have it tweet and indicate uh, when the soil needed to be watered. And so we had some silly phrases like, uh, you know, the kale needs watering. Um, I, I don't remember what else we had off the top of my head. But actually one of the problems we ran into with this and we had to pull it back out of the uh, application with the kids is uh, the Twitter APIs will not let you repeat a message, the, the same message, within some time window. Um, so if you tried to say the same thing uh, within you know, three or four days uh, via the API, it denies it as a duplicate message. So then we ran into, well, we'll add different messages. And let's see, I have, so we added different messages. And then we ended up just having to stick an incrementer on the end of it so that we could get the messages to go through. Uh, so if there's anybody who works at Twitter who can get us unblocked with that, that would be fantastic because we have these applications we want to do with these kids, but we have to do silly things uh, that, that make it more difficult to explain to the kids. You know, we have to say, well, we have to add this code on here because of the Twitter thing, and it just is cumbersome. So, um, so we learned from this experiment, though, and uh, we... Um, started investigating other technological platforms, and uh, one of the ones that we found uh, is the Electric Imp. And uh, at this point, Jessica will talk about what we did with that. I'm going to go back just to give them props. So this is, this is our windmill at the farm, and it was actually installed by the HP engineering team. It's 23 feet tall, and um, Cox Communication it has turned it into a Wi-Fi tower. So that's how we have Wi-Fi. Uh, in the farm, and the kids thought they were unbelievably creative when they came up with the tweeting windmills handle. That was a 12-year-old that came up with that, and um, so we we uh, we love our windmill. He will tweet more. So, like Jesse was saying, the Intel Edison, it was hard, and it required a lot of soldering. Which, as a beginning IoT device, to bring in a soldering iron which caused me so much pain, um, and all the install. We needed something that was quick and fast and delivered quickly, and, and so we came up with the electric imp. Jesse had, had played with it before, and so we tested it this summer, and we have now had 84 different kids do their first IoT project on electric imp, and it has yet to not thrill everybody. So um, I'm gonna show you, if you're not familiar with the electric imp, this is, it's a company out of Santa Clara. And that little card, the devil, they love that too, the little devil sign on the card. But it has the little card that you put in the little reader and 
plug in. And so this is how fast it is for the kids. They take it out of a package, they plug it in, they plug it in just for power, and it immediately starts blinking colors. So they're ecstatic immediately. And then it gets even cooler because you have to hook this up to Wi-Fi. And how you hook it up to Wi-Fi is an app on your phone or your iPad and called the Blink Up. Now, I'm going to do the Blink Up. If you are prone to seizures, then you want to close your eyes for this part. And it looks like this. And now you can see that it's green, and that means that it's hooked up to Wi-Fi. So they pretty much love that immediately, as you might imagine. It's all Tom. And then, uh, uh, oh, your browser's here. And off? then you're over here, and we have to do that. Perfect. So even better, the IDE is a browser. So there's no install at all. They're up immediately. How, can I see the things? Yeah. So this is actually from our last camp. You can see they name their devices very interesting names. Um, and we, we uh, taught them. Can I show here too or no? Well, that was where we did the duplicate thing, and then it was bad. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. We tried to duplicate the display earlier, and it crashed the laptop. So, so how am I going to see that? Just tilt your neck over there. But I can, the mouse is not doing it. Uh, okay. Over here. Now your mouse over there. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to go down to, does that say, what does that say, Sea Dragon? Yeah. Okay. So open that up. And I'm going to build and run this code. And as you can see, it's basically three lines of code repeated. And if you look around the room, you will see a lit up electric amp showing blue and white LED lights somewhere in the room. Indicate if you're the first to see it. It's over on the trash can. So that's the coolest thing about the electric imp is that it just needs to be plugged in somewhere. And you might ask, well, OK, so you've, you've set, turned on some LED lights. What are kids going to do with that? Well, if you're my son, you come up with a very creative idea that you're going to set this on the kitchen counter. And when you would like your mother to deliver food and drink to you playing Minecraft upstairs, you'll turn on the light. And he actually was willing to come up with a color-coded system for me. So he, so you know, if it's a blue light, I'd like this. If it's a white light, I'd like this. His mother doesn't respond to it, but um, but if you can get someone to respond to your LED light sitting on the kitchen counter. But as you can see, I I basically took it from package to lit up lights pretty fast. They only had to plug in a grounding wire, a resistor, and an LED light. And um, we did this actually as an activity with 10 kids paired. You know, so we had five electric imps, one computer. And so we added an element of risk to it because we had one computer with a projector. That was the name of all of their different imps. And the rule was once you press build and run, you couldn't touch the computer again. So we got to hear great things all day like, it's a hardware problem. No, your code's not working. You know, well, it worked on the other machine. Well, you know, and it was it was fascinating because every time they pu pu push build and run, they had to go back and make adjustments before they were allowed to come back to the computer, and um, and they loved it. So the electric imp is our go-to IoT device with kids, and I have and uh, this is what we're going to be using at the Boys and Girls Club this year. Before we jump on, uh, just some of the tech details on the imp. Um, if you're familiar with any of the protocols of hardware stuff supports, I squared C, SPY, um, the imp has basically everything you would think of built into it. It supports it on, uh, there, are, there are five pins that you can use for I.O. on the imp, and every pin will facilitate SPY, uh, I squared C. Um, they all have pulse modulation on them. They all do analog out as well. Um, so it, it's a quite powerful little um, platform for the 25 bucks for the card. Where did I, where did I go back? Uh, and to that. So I don't know if you guys are um, aware of the fact that Pi Day of the Century was this year. 
and you know we have a kitchen um, and we had raspberry pies so we decided that we were going to figure out something with pies and um, raspberry pies and the kids came up with um, a lot of different ideas most of them didn't have anything to do with uh, the pie they were going to cook in the kitchen and we're going to show you a video and I'm going to tell you the story of the video before you see it so that you, you won't do this and you'll feel great about yourselves. Um, the first time we showed this video, there were no captions. You'll see that we have captions now. But there were no captions and we showed it to a group of 100 programmers in LA. And afterwards, they thought it was great and they came up and they wanted to know all about what were the boys coding with in the tech room. And I was taken aback because it's 70% girls. And, and when the programmers, there's this group of like 10, were asked, did you see any girls in the video? And they thought about it, and one of them said, oh yeah, the girls were baking the pies in the kitchen. And I'm like, really? Like, I was just shocked. And, and these are great guys who were so respectful to, you know, the women that were there, but we go to a default where we see boys coding, and apparently we see girls baking, but that is not the case, and so when you watch this video, I hope you see that too. Take go. I, don't know. I just did, I did that before. Yeah. pies there. Um, we had the kids working in Python and, uh, as well, and we basically gave them a simple interface to, um, uh, we, we, we bought just uh, proximity sensors. They were just uh, infrared proximity sensors. They weren't sonic or anything super fancy. Uh, so low precision, but 
um, they were able to, uh, to give us the data that we needed when some motion was detected at a you know, fairly close range. And then we uh, put a library in front of that that the kids used. So really the only number they got back from that was just the distance that it had um, perceived the emotion. And then they had to do everything else. So um, they had to write the Python to determine when should we play the alarm um, and uh, what else did they do? They had to actually do the alarm itself. They had to make the calls to have the sound play. So um, there was a little bit involved that we made them do, but, uh, and they had to assemble all the hardware with it as well. Now they didn't have to solder this time, it was just all on a breadboard. Um, but they had a lot of fun with that, as you saw. And... Um, recording booth. Oh yeah, the recording as well. That, as you heard some of the things that the, the recordings were, uh, there is definitely a difference between what 10-year-old boys and 10-year-old girls will put in their recordings. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, and they, this was filtered. We didn't show you all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and then the the big payoff too at the end was their parents came and all the kids got to show their parents what they had made. And uh, it's it's pretty impressive when the parents are surprised about the complexity of something that their kids can put together. Like that was a fun thing to see. Uh, the parents had had apparently envisioned they, they heard what we were doing, but they had envisioned something far far simpler than what we did even though what we did really wasn't that hard. Uh, and all the kids had no problem with it. It was a complete success for all of them, so. So I'm just gonna talk about really quick um, the, the other thing that we're working on right now and developing is, is introducing kids also to, to data. And what we did this summer is we did something called Data Unplugged because in order to visualize and manipulate data, you need to learn a lot of stuff first before you end up with the pretty picture. And so what we had them do to understand, you know, data, because they, they kept asking questions about it, is we had them um, go out in the garden and grab kale and basil. And then we went to the grocery store and bought pine nuts and pistachios, and they made um, pesto four ways. So they were in the kitchen for a while, and they made four different kinds of pesto, and they took it home, and they had their parents and their siblings and neighbors taste test four different kinds of pesto, and then they brought it back the next day. And they started organizing data. And it was fascinating to watch how kids would organize data, because we really didn't give them any rules on how to do it. We introduced them to the work of David McCandless, who's the Information is Beautiful guy, and showed them how simple, gorgeous data visualizations could be. And then we gave them post-its and yarn, and all kinds of crazy stuff and blank white walls and had them to data visualizations. And then we had a data expert from the community come in and judge them. And one of the things that was great is, um, is he told the kids, as a consumer, if you're trying to get me to buy your pesto, I want that data visualization. But as a businessman making a you know, determination, I would want that one. And they learned a lot, but mostly, um, as all of you are part of the tech community, most people in the tech community, when you're doing something fun with kids, if they can be helpful, they will show up. Most people don't know what to do, but if you give them an assignment, I've never had anybody say no to me. I am at the Boys and Girls Club, which you know everybody pretty much likes, but, um, but I've had so many people just go out of their way to figure things out for us. And um, so this is our contact information. If you have any questions for us, or if you have the Twitter solution, that is really... <laughs> That, that would be amazing. The Twitter solution is our biggest thing. Um, but we, but uh, we are going to be doing more stuff. If you want to follow our tweeting, tweeting windmill, he will start tweeting again. We're starting the new user group session right now, and we're really excited to see what the kids come up with, what problems they want to solve next. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll take questions, too, if yeah. you have any. It does solve the problem. Okay. It's just, but it's not as fun right, as if it just. It's an annoying nuance to have to explain to the kids as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. Anybody else? Uh, it doesn't do anything right now. It's there just for aesthetics, basically. Um, the windmill could facilitate a water pump and those things. 
and we have talked about putting that on. Uh, one of the projects we are going to do with the kids is um, actually having to measure, we're gonna get a compass and put on there and having to record wind speed and direction. Um, and they're going to have to uh, do the wind speed determination with math and everything uh, based on the rotation of the, uh, the windmill. So that's, the, that's the other reason we had to go electric imp is that when you have a 23 foot windmill, you can put, because they do it themselves, so you can put kids up 23 feet one time. But if we had to get them up there with a laptop to change the code every single time, we would have a problem. So, um, so that way we can install electric imps and then do everything from the ground. And yeah. That, oh, did you? I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you back. go first. So, so this is how we've done it, is, um, is for the summer camps we do charge. We do scholarship kids also, but we do, um, we do charge for that, and that has funded a lot of the equipment. Um, but we've also gotten a lot of donations. Hmm? How much did you charge? We charged for Barbacode uh, this summer, the first summer we charged 250, and this summer we charged 295, and that's full day for five days. Um, but like I said, the computer programming counselors, the 16-year-olds, they're, they're cheaper. They're, they're cheaper to pay. They're the only ones in this equation that actually get paid, and they get paid on purpose. Um, because both of those kids were willing to be volunteers, but we said, no, you have a skill um, that needs to be recognized. And that has been very interesting to the user group kids because the idea that they get paid because they have this skill um, ha has been inspiring to them. And then the other thing is, um, we did get a Cox grant for $5,000, and then um, HP has given us a couple machines, but the Raspberry Pi monitors, um, we used old monitors. Like, we actually put an email out and, and said, does anybody have monitors? Because we have all laptops at the, at, the, um, at the center, so people were, there were a lot of uh, monitors they were happy to get rid of. Oh, I'm sorry, there's both of you are in a line. Can you go? Go ahead. So we happen to be on school property, the Boys and Girls Club um, in, in Encinitas is where I'm located. And we're most Boys and Girls Club, I don't want to say most, a lot of Boys and Girls Clubs are on school property. So we're next door to a um, middle school. And yes, so we actually have a meeting in November to talk to the middle school about implementation in there. We really consider ourselves a pilot program and we're trying to, you know, make all the mistakes before we give anybody advice on on what to do next. Oh, can I get him really quick? Oh yeah, he, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, go. So, to be honest, I think the initial interest was that we were they, it was summer and they needed their kids to go somewhere and we were a fair, we, you know, we're cheaper than surf camp. Like that was, I do, I do think a big thing. A lot of um, people we had wanted their kids exposed to computer programming, so they were seeking it out. Um, there's not a lot of options for that in San Diego. I don't think there's a lot of options for that anywhere. But, um, so it was random. We got a random group, but the thing that they had in common was they had, most of them had very little tech experience and they were all middle school kids and none of them had it in school. The, so the curriculum that we started with is actually from an, um, another nonprofit called Teaching Kids Programming. Teachingkidsprogramming.org. It's the same as my, um, my email address. And I do do training for them. I do train on that curriculum. I've trained other teachers, and there are school teachers using that curriculum. And it's fantastic. And uh, it has kids up in coding in three minutes. It uses the intentional method of teaching coding. And so that is the, the two kids, Brick and Samantha, who taught. That's what they started teaching with. And so in the morning, they would do Java. In the afternoon, they would do whatever crazy thing that we came up with with all our weird devices and stuff. And, and one of the things, and I think that this is a common theme for a lot of people, is the failures are just as much fun. 
when it doesn't work, the kids are having just as much fun trying to figure out why things are not working. And so, um, more fun. More fun. <laughs> They're having more fun. Lessons learned hard or lessons learned well. Exactly. <laughs> and they, and they, uh, yeah, and so they, they don't mind it. They don't mind it when we sit there going, huh, I have no idea why this is happening this way. And you, you, the, if anything, they enjoy it. But I think starting with a programming language is the way to go. The electric imp uses squirrel, which is awesome because it's so much fun to say. You just say squirrel to the kids and they get excited. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I'm a, big, I'm, I'm a big fan of just getting them to do anything, but they need to see payoff really fast. Um, so I mean, it's option. I mean, you could do, um, you know, they they all will basically take USB power of some kind, so we can just hook up that way. But then, um, if we want to do the extra work of soldering on external power, I mean, most of them have a voltage regulator on them, so you can put a nine volt on them if you want, and and it'll be fine. We've thought about doing on top of the windmill doing solar, and we have once you know, Chris, who's an engineer at HP, has said he was willing to take on that task of figuring out, remember, not how not just to do it, but how to then show a kid how to do it. There's a hand back there behind the camera. Okay. Hi. Can you speak up just oh, a little? Did, did we notice a difference based on the language? Okay. Um, so anything that you're exposing them to is new in, in our case. And so, um, they have not really expressed a preference, but the only thing they've really been exposed to is Java, Squirrel, and Python. Um, when, they were, when they were using the Python, the Python was the least of their problems. The hardware for the Raspberry Pi and trying to think of something else disgusting to say in the re recording booth was the high priority of that whole day. So um, they didn't express difficulty with it, but we did make that as easy as possible because we knew the hardware was going to be such a challenge. Any others? Yeah. A scratch? Well, um, scratch is great. I mean, anything's great. You, the, but the thing that's really happening right now is that there are elementary school teachers who are tackling this issue. And then you get to high school where basically the first thing, if they have anything, it's AP computer science. And middle school is when you lose kids. And AP computer science is not popular. It's at my local high school, has 2,500 kids. They were running it once every other year. They're now running it once every year. And, um, and the main reason when we started talking to kids about why they wouldn't take AP computer science is they didn't feel like they were qualified to take it because, you know, if you're taking AP bio, you've had bio. There's, there's more kids taking the AP geography test than the AP computer science test right now. And where we're really losing them is middle school. And so exposing them to just a little bit of programming you know, in a math class in middle school, in anything in middle school, in an after school program, will change the way they look at it. So that's the other reason for Java, the AP Comp Sci t test is in Java. So the AP Comp Sci class is primarily Java. There's so much in our culture that makes technology and science and math in general seem hard and difficult and, you know, oh, you have to be really smart to do it. And uh, in that middle school age range is where, um, you know, as, as kids start to really develop more of their social groups and those kinds of their, their activity groups and things, that's where they seem to start to filter out and uh, avoid, you know, they, they, they hone in on what they're interested in. And, you know, there's a natural tendency to not want to do things that are hard, even if you haven't experienced it as being hard, if you're told that all the time. And that's what, that's what kids hear from our society about technology and science and math in general. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason why let's bring it to the context they're already in. These, the, the, the kids we had easy access to were already in this healthy lifestyles program. They were doing cooking and, and, uh, and raising crops. So it was, let's just apply it to what they're already doing. And now they're not focusing on the technology, although they have come out to be, but they're, it's, it's augmenting what they're already doing. And they automatically see that it's not hard. 
but we're kind of tricking them into doing it in some sense uh, initially. And then they really get into it. And now we have a lot of focus on the technology. What I've observed about girls in tech um, is that they don't need swag bags and they don't need pink balloons and they don't need, you know, they, they don't need all of that stuff. They, they do want to tackle serious things, but they want to do it as a group, especially in middle school. Failing on your own is not okay with middle school kids. But if there's eight of them and they're all working on something together and they're failing and succeeding together, then it's fantastic. And, um, and we really watch them take charge. We have um, both girls and boys in the user group they are good friends with each other. Um, a lot of them, their preferred person to pair program with is a member of the opposite sex, and sometimes it's not. It's all personality driven. And, but they want to solve things. And so for them, it wasn't that they were super interested in learning to code, but they wanted the windmill to tweet. They wanted the moisture sensor to, you know, to give back a reading. And, and that seems, um, it's not gender specific, but girls light up at that. The, we're gonna solve something. Programming for just programming sake was, is, uh, it's not as interesting to me, and it hasn't seemed to be as interesting to the kids that I'm working with. Good. All right, thanks for Thank you so much.